Hello everyone, I'm Katie Bird. I'm a master's student at the University of Delaware in the Aerocology program, and I'm so excited to be here with you all. Today I'm gonna to be talking about Purple Martin post-breeding movements and how they vary in the Mid-Atlantic. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm gonna start by echoing some statistics we'll probably hear a lot. 90% uh, of all Purple Martins breed in the Eastern US, so that's most of the global population. And Martins have declined by almost 1% per year between 1966 and 2015, resulting in a 50-year decline of 37%. So to the right, I just have this relative population graph so we can really visualize what that loss looks like. So the threats to Martins include nest competition from non-native cavity competitors, such as the house sparrow and eastern starling. Um, they're also threatened by pesticide use as obligate insectivores. Anything that impacts insect abundance is going to in impact them. They're susceptible to habitat loss, both on the breeding ground and the wintering ground, and also to cold snaps, particularly when arriving on the breeding ground. So a little bit of background about my project. A part of my project deals with tracking martins with radio telemetry. So um, we do this using the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System, which is an international collaborative effort to have a network of radio receivers that allow uh, researchers everywhere to have their tagged animals tracked. So MODIS is used to try, tag birds, bats, and even insects such as dragonflies. So to the left I have a recent map of all, where all of the 434 megahertz frequency receivers are in the North America and some in South America. And to the right I have an example of one of our receivers. So this is a 45-foot telescoping mass pop-up tower that's located at London Grove in Pennsylvania. So it has a power bank at the bottom with the solar panel and the receiver, and then the Yagis are at top, and that's what detects our tags. So my study area encompasses over 2,000 square kilometers in northern Delaware and southeastern Pennsylvania. I have towers at London Grove, Longwood Gardens, the Delaware Museum of Nature and Science, which was formerly the Museum of Natural History, DuPont Environmental Education Center, on, on one building on campus and at Bucktoe Creek Preserve. So the towers at Bucktoe and Deke are part of the Northeast MODIS collaboration, so I'm very happy to be able to work with that crew to expand my array and, um, and help with data management. So uh, I also have on the right an example of what our colonies look like. This is Bucktoe Creek Preserve. It's uh, composed of three Troyagord racks um, located in a meadow setting, and our colonies at Ashland and Curtis Mill look very similar. So for what we're talking about today, we're looking at 67 individual martins from the 2021 field season. So we started tagging in April and finished monitoring in October. These were composed of 43 adults and 24 hatch years, and the adults were uh, composed of 20 males and 23 females. And of those birds, we were able to de detect four on fall migration and we were able to get data for most of them for uh, the local array and breeding season. So once the array was in place um, in 2020, so we started the 2021 field season by capturing our birds, and we started with the adults as they arrived at the colony. And for adults, we trapped them in the gourds using a trap door. So this is a live sparrow trap method, but basically there's a little door that has a trip and when the bird enters the gourd, it just closes the door behind them, and then we can lower the rack and take them out and, and do what we need to do. So after the bird is handled, is captured, we band it with an aluminum leg band, the federal band, and apply the tag via a leg loop harness. So let me just, um, I didn't actually have a picture of what the harness looked like somehow. Uh, so I have a little animation for you of, it's two loops with a little knot that we put super glue on and then we're good to go. So once the birds are tagged and the super glue is dry, we either release them and return them to the gourd. And uh, after the bird is returned to the wild, we monitor them visually to make sure there aren't any complications with the tags um, on, their, on their movement or behavior to make sure that we've done everything correctly. And then we monitor them remotely for the rest of the season um, as we get all of the data submitted via cellular connection. So we can monitor them in almost real time. So for my data analysis, I started by visualizing everything with charts because it's really important to get an idea of what your data looks like. And then 
I did some simple statistics in Excel, uh, did an F test to see if the variances were equal for the two variables I wanted to look at, and then um, did a corresponding T test based on that. So the results for the full season for all birds were for 63 of our 67 birds, we were able to get a last array detection date. Um, so this was the date a bird was last detected within our local array of towers to define local departure. Um, so this ranged from the 23rd of June to the 20th of September, with the mean being the 4th of August. Um, but the most frequent date that the birds left the local area was the 30th of July. And then I examined the distribution of the duration of time spent near the colony, meaning that the, from the date they were tagged to the date they departed the array. So this ranged from 0 to 109 days. So the 0 was a couple birds either were never detected or deserted immediately uh, upon being tagged. Um, but the mean duration in your colony was 60 days, so that makes sense given um, when they arrive at the colony, when they spend the, sp the time they spend breeding, and the little bit of time they spend there after they're done breeding. And then for some birds, I was able to determine region departure date when they started fall migration. This is the latest available date that a bird pinged multiple towers south of the array within one day. So we're very lucky in this area that we have towers south of us, uh, beyond the towers that we could put up ourselves. Um, and this, But this date wasn't always possible to determine, as some birds just will avoid the towers or their tags uh, lost their antennas before southward movement. Um, so it's important to note that antenna breakages are fairly common with tags this small regardless of their seller. Wildlife tag manufacturing still has lots of room for improvement, and these are, these are small tags. They're less than a gram. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't still get lots of interesting data, especially if we are able to put up a local array like I have. Um, and let's move on to uh, the uh, results for adults. So the last array detection for adults averaged the 27th of July. <clears throat> um, we also looked at the total days detected for adults just to sort of assess um, how well our array was working to monitor them. So uh, adults averaged uh, 56 days where we were able to detect them. Um, which is almost the amount of time that they, almost every day that they're here, we can detect them. So the duration they spend near the colony averaged 73 days. So again, that's the day we, from the day we tag them to the day they leave. And then for 10 of them, we were able to determine the, the region departure date, um, which had an average of the 11th of August. And this lines up pretty well with uh, the literature which, that we have. So the Delaware Breeding Bird Atlas and the eBird information say that martins generally are gone by mid-August. So for hatch years, the last array detection date varied really widely. So it ranged from uh, 7th of July to the 20th of September with a mean of 20th of August. Um, we have a picture of one on the right here. So for hatch years, the total days detected ranged from 0 to 64 with a mean of 28. So that's lower than the adults because we tag them later in the season. The duration they spend near the colony averaged 35 days, and again, that makes sense given that they uh, aren't born until later in the season, so um, this is all making sense so far. And then for the hatch years, for 11 birds, we were able to determine the region departure date, which ranged from the 2nd of September to the 20th of September with a mean of the 10th of September. And this is interesting because, like I said, given our former resources, or for, the former literature says that birds tend to leave this area by uh, the 15th of August for Martins. But then here I have 11 birds that are all waiting until September to leave, sometimes pretty late into September. And then for hatch year, we also looked at the fledgling detection date. So this is trying to as assess how well we can see when the birds fledge just using our towers. Um, so this ranged from the 13th of July to the 7th of August. And the way I define this is the um, the date that a fledgling bird first detects a tower that is not its natal tower, so not the tower closest to its colony. So the mean was the 21st of July, which lines up well with um, the fledgling records that we have um, from standard observation. So now let's get into the results of our t-test. So for sex differences, we didn't find any I didn't find any significant differences for local departure date, the days. Uh, spent near the colony, the total days detected, and the region departure date. 
The only one that was close was the time spent near the colony. There seemed to be some level of difference between females and males, but not enough to be significant. Um, but I don't want to make any assumptions that there is any difference there because our sample size is pretty small. But for age differences, we had very significant results between hatch years and adults. So hatch years tend to depart the local array about three weeks later than adults. Um, they also stayed near the colony much shorter than adults, which makes sense because they have less time to spend there. Um, they were detected fewer days, which makes sense. Again, this is just evaluating how well our um, system is uh, describing reality. <laughs> and then for a region departure date, hatchier birds tended to leave a full month later than adult birds. And this is really interesting. So this is the most interesting um, part of my presentation. So if, you're not, if you've tuned out, please tune in. Hatchier birds tended to leave around the 10th of September and adult birds left around the 11th of August. And this is different from what the literature that I have up to this point says, where it says most martins leave um, by mid-August, but here I have hatchier birds staying until almost mid-September. So we're learning something here. And then just to finish up, I wanted to share our four migration anecdotes. Um, so these are tracks, uh, and these, these lines are not the actual accurate flight paths of the bird. They're just our best estimates given what few detections we have. So I don't, don't think that this bird crossed all this water by itself. Um, it's just it wasn't detected on any other towers in between the, this one. So these are tracks from the same bird nugget, a hatchier bird from Curtis Mill Park. I zoomed in on the left so you can get an idea of just how much a juvenile bird can explore the region before they depart on migration. You see, they, they tend to wander a lot. Um, but luckily, 10 days after leaving home, Nugget made it to Columbia on the 29th of September, which is cool. And that was very recently after the tower was put up. And then here is a track of another hatchier bird from the same colony. They departed on their migration, hitting many towers south through Virginia and disappeared for about a month, only to uh, reappear in Guanacaste, Costa Rica. So this bird was detected two days after the tower de there was set up and stopped over there for nine days. So it was pretty cool to be the first animal detected on that tower. And there were very lucky detections that the bird stay there so long. Uh, the photo on the right is not the bird in question, but I wanted to show a good photo of what the tags look like on a marten going about their business. So then we have an adult, Dwayne, who bred at Bucktoe in 2021. He departed the Mid-Atlantic on the 22nd of August and then was detected again on the 29th of September at the Panama Sewage Plant in South Panama City. And this is especially interesting because the other adult that we detected on migration was a female who bred at Curtis Mill Park, so a different colony, and she departed on the 1st of August and then was detected in the very same spot on the 19th of September. So he took over a month to get to Panama, uh, from what we know, and then she took 18 days. So even between these two anecdotal birds, we have quite a range of difference in migration times, but they both went to the same spot, so that's awesome. Two birds from two different colonies in the mid-Atlantic going through the same part of Panama. So just in, con in conclusion, I still need to analyze my other two seasons, but adults appear to vary more from juveniles than between sexes. Hatch years stay longer in our local array and the mid-Atlantic region than adults, and our results definitely depend on tag durability. So it's nearly impossible to detect purple martins on migration if the tags are not completely functional, um, but monitoring uh, Purple Martins using life tags in an automated telemetry array can still got, get you a lot of inter, inf, interesting information. So thank you for having me, and with that I am happy to answer any of your questions. And if you think of any after the question session, please feel free to contact me. Uh, my email is listed here. And thank you to all of our amazing partners and funding sources.